Hey, church family, I am so excited to be here with you tonight. I want you to grab your Bible. I want you to sit down because I've got some big, big, big news to share with you. And then we're going to dive into our Who is God series tonight. We're going to look at God is merciful is how we're going to start looking at God is merciful. But before we get into this, I want to talk to you, especially if you're local to us with Savannah, then we have um, some really big news that has come about. So, of course, since about late March when, when COVID kind of hit everywhere, we have been worshiping virtually and, and making the best of it, and I am so thankful for everyone that has helped make that possible. But all of us have been looking forward to the day that we would be able to come back and do it in a safe way. So the elders, deacons, and I all throughout this process behind the scenes have been talking and kind of coming up with a game plan of when do we feel like that is going to be a possibility. And we, we've kind of continued to push it for the safety of everybody, but we came back together and talked about it, and the elders made an executive decision to um, reinstate worship services in the building in a very limited capacity. So that, that does not mean we're going to be back to normal right away, far from it. Um, if you are not on our email list and would like to be, uh, let me know. Find me on Facebook or on our website. Uh, I'd be glad to send you a copy. We sent out an email earlier this afternoon kind of laying out some of the guidelines, and this is not an exhaustive list. There's still going to be some things that um, we're going to kind of relay in person to kind of help everybody understand kind of the procedures that we're going to go through and things like this, because at the end of the day, our utmost priority is two things. One is your spiritual health, but we're also concerned with your physical health, and part of that is going to be making sure that we're able to open back up in a way that facilitates the growth and, and the well-being of both of those items. So I won't go into any detail tonight because if you're on our email list, uh, we're going to be mailing out copies. Um, you're probably going to see this in, in multiple places. Plus, if you join us back in person, you'll hear this. Uh, the, the date for this is going to be October the 4th, the first Sunday in October. October 4 is our aim to be back in person. It'll only be for worship at 1030. Um, we're going to try to keep our worship services shorter to help um, kind of the potential spread of any kind of disease or anything like this. So um, there's lots of procedures that are getting put in place. There's going to be a lot of hard work between now and in October to help make that a, a reality. Um, we're, we're investing in some uh, some equipment to help clean and sanitize the building week to week. Um, we're going to kind of deep clean the building as it is. We've upgraded some technology to help maintain our live stream. So there's a lot happening right now. But it's exciting. It's exciting time. I want you to go ahead and jot down on your calendar. October 4th will be our first day back. In that letter, and this is the only part that I'm going to spend any time talking about tonight, we kind of laid out some very general guidelines, and this is far from exhaustive. We know everyone is excited to be back, myself included. The elders are. The deacons are. I know you are. But we still have to be cognizant of the fact that coronavirus is still very real. It's still very active. So if you don't feel well, if you are sick in any capacity, if you are fearful um, that you might contract even just the regular flu or, or coronavirus or anything like that, please, we advise you to kind of stay home. We're still going to have our live stream available um, for that very reason to kind of help folks that are going to kind of transition back to worship with us full time. But we realize that may take a little bit. So again, there's a lot more conversation to be had, but I had to share that with you tonight. We have a date. We're looking forward to it, and I hope I'll see you there. But tonight, we still have a little bit of time together here virtually, and we're going to spend our time continuing our Who is God series, looking at God is merciful and God is gracious. God is gracious and God is merciful. You know, of all the attributes of God, I think mercy is the one that is most central to our understanding of who God is, but it's also one that I certainly grew up not really understanding the full breadth of what that actually means. I heard a lot about God's mercy. Maybe you did too, growing up in church, or even just kind of in a general sense that, you know, God is merciful and God, you know, this or that. But did you really comprehend what mercy truly meant? In my opinion, if you want a glimpse into the heart of God, into the mind of God, in the, in the most simplest of terms, understanding God's mercy is that glimpse into God. Everything God does for us is stemming from his mercy towards us. 
I want to look real briefly at kind of a definition for what mercy is, and then we're going to look more at a few of the places in the Bible where we see some of God's people interacting with his mercy, and we'll see the outcome from that. So when you consider the idea of God's mercy, I want you to think with me about what it actually means. And when we talk about the idea of mercy, and in fact, if you go back uh, just a few months into last fall, I believe, if you're with us at Central or, or even worshiped with us digitally, you remember that I did a whole series on mercy. We called it the miracle of mercy. You might have a magnet at your house that says something like that. But the mercy of God really is a spectacular thing to understand and behold, because it's this, this favor that God offers to us that we don't deserve. You know, we look at the two ideas that kind of go hand in hand when we think about mercy. The other one, you probably could guess it, is grace. Grace and mercy are kind of said in the same breath a lot of times because they really kind of are hand in hand. They're different, but there's a lot of overlap to them. I think my fear is sometimes we assume that God offers us his mercy and his grace on accident or that God is sorry for us and so he offers us his grace and his mercy just to kind of get it over with and move on because he realizes how bad we really are. Friends, do you recognize that Scripture could not point us in a more opposite direction than that thought right there? In fact, Scripture points us to the very clear idea that God's mercy is as big as we think it is. It is as all-encompassing as we think it might be, and it all stems perfectly from God's strength and desire to have a relationship with you and me. You know, we continue looking in verses like Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, Luke chapter 1 and verse 78, it talks about the tender mercy of our God, that God extends it to us like a gift, that he wants us to have it. It's not something he feels compelled to do. It's not something that he has to do, but it is something that he wants to do. I want to look a few at a few individuals in the Bible that very clearly interact with God's mercy, the first of which is Moses. I want you to look with me at Exodus chapter 33 and verse 19. Exodus 33 and verse 19. It talks, is one of the most beautiful sections of scripture, in my opinion, in all the Bible. Because God, uh, Moses comes to God and basically asks him, uh, asks God how to show him his glory. How is that going to happen? And here's what God says back. He says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy mercy. You know, when Moses asks him how to see God's glory, when, when Moses says, God, how am I able to witness how great you are, how big you are, how capable you are, do you recognize that the vehicle that God chooses to use to show his glory, his majesty, his power is mercy? Friends, that right there is a turning point. It is a game changer. It is revolutionary in our understanding of the creator of the universe. Friends, every other person that has had an ounce of power in this entire world for the history of all mankind, if asked how to show their power, their might, their glory, they will do something that is self-serving. They will either use fear, they will use aggression, they will use influence. They will do something that serves them best to show others how powerful they are. That's what makes our God different. He says, you want to see how great I am? I'm going to show you how merciful I am by showing you and not giving you the punishments that you so frequently deserve. If you just go over a few verses in Exodus chapter 34, 6 through 7, God says this beautiful line here that's talking about God himself. You know, one of the beautiful attributes of God's mercy is that he is free to offer it to anyone that he pleases. See, the unique part about God, about Israel, about all of us as Christians who have accepted and received God's mercy is that it's the one thing in this world that is not merit-based. The mercy God offers to you and to me is based nothing on what we do. You know, when he showed mercy to Israel back in the Old Testament, it wasn't necessarily because Israel was all that much better than anybody else. It wasn't because Israel was doing everything perfectly, but it was because God made a deliberate decision to show favor when favor wasn't warranted. And he has made that same decision for you and me over and over and over and over again up until present day. 
Look with me in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. It says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. Listen to this description. It says, Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. This is the God we serve that, that shows us favor when you and I do not deserve it. You know, we look at one of my favorite displays of mercy in all the Bible is found in the Old Testament book of Psalm chapter 51. David, one of the great kings of Israel, one of the great psalmist writers that we have for us, writes what is probably his most well-known psalm in Psalm 51, which is this lament, this confession of all the stuff David had done wrong. And friends, at that point, David had ran the gamut. I mean, David had done some messed up stuff. And notice how he starts his psalm in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Friends, I want you to take a step back and recognize, because you and I hone in on one very, very particular characteristic of God more probably than anything else. And I'm not saying it's wrong. I do it as often as you do. But I want you to stop here. We focus on God's forgiveness. We continually pray and say, God, forgive me. Forgive what I've done wrong. But friends, how often do we say, God, have mercy on me? Forgiveness and mercy, just like grace and mercy, have a lot of overlap. But friends, they're distinctly different. And we're not going to spend our time, you know, drawing up a big Venn diagram to go back and forth between the two. But I want to challenge you this week. If you take nothing else away from this lesson tonight, I want to challenge you. Will you pray for mercy this week? Not to say that we forgo forgiveness, not to say that we still don't talk to God about these other things, but will you add in mercy? Because you recognize that David could have asked for anything. For as bad as David had gotten, David at that point was one of the closest people in the universe to God. The Bible tells us that David was a man after God's own heart, and he had a direct line to God. He was Israel's king. So if there was ever anybody that, was, that had this right here with God, it was David. It was the king of Israel. And you notice that instead of going to any of these other attributes that you and I have already talked about in this Who is God series, or anything else that we've yet to talk about, David spends the first line of when he is going to God in his hour of need. He says, God, I've messed up and I need you and you alone. You notice the characteristic that he hones in on and it's like a dog on a bone. He will not let it go is God's mercy. It's not God's love. It's not necessarily God's forgiveness. And you notice those two things are in here. He says, have mercy on me because of your love. He's going to go on to say, forgive my sins because you're the God that you are. But you notice what he actually asks for is God's mercy. God, will you have mercy on me? You know, you fast forward a little bit in David's story. A part of David's story that we don't talk about a tremendous amount, but we can find it in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24, again, David had kind of fallen away from God and one of the prophets of God came to David and said, hey, God's not pleased with what you've done. You've got three choices. He says, you can go three years of famine can come into your land or you will three flee three months before your foes while they pursue you or shall there be three days of pestilence in your land. This is 2 Samuel 24 and verse 13. Then we go to 2 Samuel 24 and verse 14. And we see this very clear in, insight into the heart of God from the eyes and mind of David. He says, let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. David says, I would rather take the very worst that God has to offer, because I know at the end of the day, my God is a merciful God than anything man could do to me. Friends, that's the God we serve. We look at Jeremiah, one of the major prophets throughout the Old Testament, wrote one of the largest books in all the Bible, and Jeremiah wept for mercy. Jeremiah was a prophet at a time when God's people were really far from God. They were not what they should be. 
For the sake of time, we won't look through it all, but I encourage you to look through the book of Lamentations in particular, which Jeremiah is credited most of the time for writing. And if you look at Jeremiah chapter uh, 3, Jeremiah chapter 4 in particular, Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet for a reason because he basically spends a lot of his time crying and wailing and weeping to God saying, God, please, please have mercy on your people. They are wrong. I know that. You know that. But give them another chance. Will you have mercy on them? And then I want to end looking at mercy and we're going to transition into God's uh, graciousness. But we look at Paul who marveled at God's mercy. Paul in the New Testament, one of the New Testament writers, and I could give you a laundry list of verses here where we see Paul that was just blown away by the mercy of God. You look in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 13 and 16. You know, we even look in the book of Romans in chapter 9, it talks about the God who has mercy. God is a God of mercy. And if you look at that phrase in in Romans 9 and verse 16, when it says God who has mercy, that literally means the mercy having God, meaning that God's mercy is an innate part of him. It's built into him. You cannot separate it from any other part of who he is or his character. Romans chapter 9 verses 22 and 23 gives us a deep, deep glimpse into the heart of God. And we find at the very core of it, at the very bottom of it, we find mercy in no uncertain terms. You know, our God isn't just a God of power. He's not just a God of control. He's not just simply a God of uncompromising justice, but he is a mercy-having, mercy-giving, mercy-desiring God. Friends, that's who we serve. Let's transition here and look at the graciousness of God. We're going to kind of wrap up here for tonight. God is gracious. What does that even mean? God is gracious. To be gracious means to favor or show kindness. Now, you're probably now understanding why I put mercy and graciousness together. Because kind of like grace, grace, mercy, and graciousness... They, they you know, are kind of all talking about a very similar idea, but they're different in one way or another. But to be gracious means to favor, to show kindness to an inferior, to be compassionate. In the Old Testament of the Bible, the adjective used um, often describes the favor that God offers one or another. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 18, it says, Let the Lord long to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. Friends, that's who we serve, a God that continually shows us compassion, that shows us mercy, that comes to our aid when we do not deserve it. God is gracious because God is also a God of love. God shows us favor when we don't deserve it because he loves us. He wants us to succeed. His character is to love even when love is not returned to him. You know, you think about it in the way of a parent relationship, which we look at a lot of times together. You know, a parent loves a child no matter what. A parent should love a child regardless of what that child might say or do in the moment. God is the exact same way. God knows the bigger picture. God knows that he will continue to love us regardless of what we might do. God is gracious because he's our creator. God is gracious because he loves us and created us. He knit us together the way the scriptures talk about it in our mother's womb. He built us from the ground up. And just like anything that you have a hand in creating, it means more. It is more. It's special. God views us in the same way. Ephesians chapter 1 shows us God's grace. It says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Friends, you want to see one of the the very clearest the very easiest to understand displays of the graciousness of God in Scripture, you don't have to look very far. You look at God's Son. You look at the delivery of Jesus to this earth. You look at the fact that He became a mortal man. The fact that He endured every temptation that you and I did. And you very clearly see the graciousness, the favor that God extends to me and you. Friends, that was a whole lot of work, a whole lot of pain, a whole lot of heartache to do for nothing. God did it not for nothing, but because he loves us so much. He did it because he cares about us. He did it because we are his special creation, as the Bible describes it. 
James chapter 1 and verse 17 says he does not change like the shifting set shadows. There is not a time when God's mercy and God's graciousness are not in effect for you and me. There's nothing that we can do. There's no place that we can hide that would separate us from those qualities of God. If you look in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not for yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in us for advance. The grace of God is, is one of the connectors that connects us to salvation. It gives us an opportunity to interact with Jesus. It gives us an opportunity to come in contact with his blood. Friends, I am so thankful to be with you tonight as we continue to seek God's mercy, God's grace, his graciousness in our life. Friends, I'd like to pray for us as we think about these two things tonight, as we think about coming back together to worship, even in a limited capacity soon. I'd like to spend a moment in prayer with you, and then we'll wrap up for the evening. But would you pray with me? My most holy and gracious Heavenly Father, God, I come before you with thanksgiving. I am thankful to have the opportunity to look forward to getting to worship together with your people once again. Lord, we know that we've made the best of our situation and that we're able to worship you anywhere, that our church buildings are nothing more than that. They're buildings. We know that we can worship you at church. We can know we can worship you at home. We can worship you anywhere we might be. But Lord, we know from your word that communal worship, together worship is special, that you built the church for that very reason. And God, we're thankful to have the opportunity to come back. We pray that we're able to do it in a mindful way, in a safe way. God, for tonight, I pray that we would strive to seek your mercy and your grace. I pray, Lord, that we would eternally go after you and the things that you would have us to learn. Lord, I pray through this series that we all come to know you in a more intimate way and that we can grow that relationship and apply these principles to our everyday life. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness because we know we fail you. And we ask all these things, Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Friends, what a joy it's been to be with you tonight, to get to talk to you about, about coming back together soon. Uh, friends, I want to ask that you continue to watch your email, watch Facebook. Um, we'll continue to put out updates and, and give you uh, more written instructions and things like this if you work, worship with us locally. If you worship with us digitally, we'll continue to do our live streams like normal so you your services won't be interrupted at all. I hope you'll join me tomorrow and Friday as we do some more Curious Christian videos and then back together on Sunday as we continue our Twisted series that we started this past week. I look forward to seeing you there.